Hi, everyone. Welcome. Thanks for joining. We'll get started in just a few minutes here. Welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining us. All right, so we're a minute past the hour, so I guess we'll get started. So first, welcome to today's um, data site member meeting and to the data site service providers forum. And before we get started today, just a couple of reminders. Um, first, you can tweet about all the sessions using the hashtag datasite22. And also, please feel free to introduce yourself in the Zoom chat. The session, as you saw when you came in, will be recorded. And um, it will also share this publicly on our YouTube channel. And then throughout the session, um, please do share your questions using the Q&A tool. Um, the purpose of the session is to ask questions of our data site service providers. So as um, we're going through the first part, um, please share anything that you think of that comes up, all our questions to our panelists. And so our, our agenda today is focused on the Data Site Service Providers Program. And so I'll give a brief introduction to this to start off, and then we'll jump right into discussion with our four panelists who are representing four of our data site service providers. We have several questions prepared for all the panelists to answer about their repository platforms, the integrations of data sites, and the metadata that they submit to data sites. And then after that, we'll open things up for audience Q&A for the rest of the session. So the Data Site Service Providers Program is for repository platform and CRIS system developers. Our registered service providers provide software that integrates with a data site API in order to allow data site members to register DOIs and use their own API credentials. The primary goal of the program is to support these developers in adopting and implementing DOI best practices. And we launched this program in fall of 2020, and now it includes 15 different service providers. And we hold quarterly calls with our service providers to encourage exchanging information and to provide support for them with any questions that come up with maintaining integration. So to become a registered service provider, the platform provider must integrate a data site API in order to allow data site members to register DOIs following best practices. And the registration process starts with an application initial registration review where the platform developer demonstrates that their integration um, meets various requirements. And we require that the integration supports our metadata schema version 4.0 or higher, and also that the provider can provide documentation and first line support to and users of the platform with regards to the data site DOI integration. And so the, the process helps repository platform and users by ensuring that DOI registration integrations are high quality and have good support um, and integration with the systems. It also helps to ensure consistency across different DOI registration integrations um, through the best practice guidelines that service providers are following. And then most importantly, I think it helps to engage our service providers in the data site community. And so the users of repository platforms that are supported by our service providers are some of the largest users of data site APIs. So we're always wanting to work closely with these providers to ensure that any changes we make to data site services are in the best interest of our users. And so for more information about the program, you can check out these links on the data site website, and I can put these in the chat after this. Um, so just to give a sense of who our service providers are, we currently have 15 who are listed on the left side of this table. And then the platforms that they support with um, the head data site integrations are listed on the right side. And so it's important to know, um, we get this question a lot, that when we register a service provider, we're registering the organization or the company that's developing the integration as a provider of that specific integration. And so that means there isn't always a one-to-one -one relationship here, so particularly in the case of open source projects like vSpace, um, we have more than one service provider supporting the same integration. And so today on our panel, I'm excited to introduce that we have representatives from four of these service providers, the, data site, um, the Dataverse project, excuse me, um, CoSector, which supports the ePrint platform, Redivis, and Cayuse. 
And so before we get started, I want to formally introduce our four panelists and welcome them. So first, we have Sonia Barbosa, who is the manager of data curation for the Harvard Dataverse. And her responsibilities include initiating outreach and acquisition um, of data for Harvard Dataverse, as well as promoting the use and benefits of the Dataverse tool and Harvard repository. Will Fison works at CoSector at the University of London, where he helps support and develop various open access repositories, and primarily the open source ePrints repository platform. Ian Matthews is the CEO and co-founder of Redivis, and Redivis is a data platform that is focused on helping academic institutions distribute data sets and giving researchers the tools to understand them. And Taylor Mudd is a senior software engineer for Haplo Services. His responsibilities include core software development and maintenance for the Cayuse suite of products, primarily Cayuse repository, ideation of new features and functionality, and assisting with planning the product roadmap. All right, so I guess we'll get started here. So we've got four questions for all of our panelists, and then we'll open things up for audience Q&A. And so before we dive into anything specific to data site, I'd like us to first get to know all the different platforms that you all represent. And so first, could you please share um, a brief introduction to the platform, including the communities you work with, who your typical users are, and the types of research outputs that your software supports. And I think we'll go in order for this. We'll start with Sonia on this one. Okay, so I can uh, share my screen briefly? Sure, I will turn this off for you. So. Okay, thank you. And I won't put it in presentation mode because I think everybody can see it just fine. It's easier not to have it in presentation mode. So um, I'm with the Dataverse Project and the Harvard Dataverse is at IQSS, as mentioned. Um, thank you for having me here today. It's a pleasure. Um, so we have um, 89 installations of our open source platform around the world. The code for the platform is hosted on GitHub and uh, we are supported by a large community of coders and developers that contribute features to the software that we make available for use. Um, for the community users and research output, the software can be used by any organization and institution that wants to share data. Um, and since it's open source, uh, there are a number of, of Dataverse installations that are not on our map because they are internal to their communities. So they are not, um, they're sharing data basically just within their organization, um, but it does give them um, a space to um, share data. Uh, not all installations are generalist repository, which is what this tool was initially built for. Um, the Harvard Dataverse is a generalist repository that's open to the worldwide research community. Um, Odom, um, Odom's installation also um, serves kind of as a, a generalist repositories as they serve uh, a community outside their university. But um, each installation can decide what research output they support, but all DOIs related to Dataverse installations are expected to point to content containing data that can be reused. So Harvard Dataverse, um, you, while you can deposit um, supplementary documentation, um, codes, we still require that data that go along with those documentation and code be deposited. And those are the features that um, the data of our software supports. Great, thanks, Sonia. Um, okay. I guess we'll move, yeah, and we'll move to, to Will next. I'll put the question back up if we want. Uh, yes, excellent. Um, uh, thanks, Heidi. So I'm uh, Will, and yes, thank you for having us uh, along today. Um, so uh, yeah, ePrints. Uh, so ePrints um, is an open source repository platform. Um, it's sort of been around for 20 plus years now, I suspect. Um, and we have about sort of, there's sort of 700 repositories worldwide, um, 700 plus repositories worldwide um, uh, on our last sort of estimate. Uh, and they can be supported by either a, like a, a, there's a handful of service uh, service providers out there who provide support. But as it's an open source software uh, repository, uh, lots of institutions um, host their own uh, repositories as well. Um, and so mostly it's in use by universities and research institutes. Um, but I believe there are also a few sort of corporate users out there as well who use it sort of internally for uh, for um, re uh, recording uh, research outputs. Um, for those sort of companies that uh, do research. Um, and so in line with that, with regards to most of the 
the repository is being used in research institutes. Most of our users, of course, are also researchers. Um, although often, of course, we have there are repository administrators who or librarians who are doing a lot of deposits on behalf of researchers and things like that. So they're, so they're sort of people actually engaging with the platform on a day to day basis. Um, and with regards to sort of what uh, outputs can be stored in a repository, I mean, most typically it is journal articles and conference items. Uh, but there's also a, quite an extensive a number of data repositories that run ePrints now. Um, so lots of data sets there and and uh, lots of like um, uh, PhD uh, theses. theses. Um, uh, and so typically often that is where, where the data site is again, uh, used an awful lot for, uh, for, for generating DOIs in the context of sort of yeah, data sets and PhDs and, and that sort of thing. Um, so yeah, that's a quick sort of introduction to ePrints, I think. Awesome, great. Thanks, Will. Um, over to Ian from Rediviz. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, so Rediviz kind of at, at a high level is an online data platform um, that is designed to help research labs, centers, libraries, and other um, academic organizations distribute rich data sets. Uh, we support a pretty wide variety of data um, and kind of research questions therein. Um, so there are tabular and non-tabular data types on Rediviz. And we have researchers from disciplines in medicine, environmental sciences, political sciences, and, and really all else in between. Um, I think something that's maybe a little bit not, not unique, but uh, one of our kind of focuses is that Rediviz is designed for uh, data across various uh, risk profiles. So we kind of initially cut our teeth um, with PHI in our initial use case at Stanford. Um, and so we've designed the platform to support data kind of across the, the risk spectrum, you know, everything from completely public data to um, highly restricted PHI and have provided the administrative mechanisms to easily control and access uh, and audit access uh, to to restricted data sets. Um, I'll try to make uh, this experience as painless as possible from uh, a researcher's perspective in terms of applying for access and, and being able to see data, you know, see metadata at least before uh, you uh, identify data stuff that you want to work with and apply to gain access. Um, and then finally, Reddit is, is a, also a comprehensive analytical platform. Um, so we offer researchers an array of tools that they can use to perform collaborative and reproducible analyses, um, especially on, on large data sets at scale. Uh, we have a SQL interface with a graphical interface, a GUI on top um, that allows for manipulation of large data sets. So things like filtering, aggregating, joining um, different data sets that they have access to, um, as well as computational notebook environments um, supporting Python and R runtimes. Um, we really don't want to build yet another data silo. So we're built on open technologies. We have an open API. Um, so you can you know, pull data from Rediviz and do your analysis elsewhere. Um, but having this compute environment, especially for the higher risk data, is incredibly helpful since um, you know, not always can, as a researcher, allowed to download you know, these PHIs to their laptop or to some other compute environment. So allowing for that analysis to take place where the data reside is, is more secure and also sometimes more performant. Um, and yeah, and so we just became a data site service provider this year. Um, we're a fairly young organization, we've been around since 2016. Um, and we're really excited about being part of data site as this allows researchers to authoritatively reference um, a data set on Rediviz at a specific version and point in time with comprehensive metadata for discovery, um, which obviously is, is really important for reproducibility. Awesome. Thanks, Ian. And um, now for Taylor from Kaiyu. Uh, yeah, thanks, everyone. Um, so yeah, a brief sort of introduction to Cayuse. Uh, so we're primarily US-based. Uh, it's a research administration software provider. Uh, and at the start of last year, that merged with a small UK-based company. Um, and sort of after that merger, we're now the only vendor to have a cloud platform built to address the entire uh, research lifecycle of needs. Uh, so as a result of this, like our users are typically everyone at a sort of a research institute or a, a university um, across our entire client base, which is around about or at least 450 institutions uh, across the US, the APEC and EMEA regions. Uh, so my focus at Cayuse is primarily on the repository product, the Cayuse repository. Um, so this is where the uh, our integration point with data style and attendance today come in. So this, uh, yeah, the repository is typically used by academics at the institution. So we've built it to be clear and concise enough that researchers feel comfortable uh, self-depositing their own outputs. So this, this tends to free up a lot of time for the library team to spend more time administrating rather than depositing on behalf of their researchers or people at the institution. 
Um, and with that flexibility, that sort of extends into the, the output types that we support as well. Um, so that's a, a generalist repository, everything textual, uh, practice-based and research data within a single system. Um, yeah, that's sort of a brief, brief overview. Awesome, great, thanks so much. Maybe we'll zigzag through um, the participant order to mix things up. So we want to the next question then. Um, and if it's okay, Taylor, we'll go back to you then. Um, but how would someone get started using your repository software and registering data site DOIs? So for example, do you offer a centrally hosted option or do repository managers need to install and host software themselves? What would the first step be? Sure. So, so both of those, both of those are options. Um, so the repository part of the Caillou suite is, is open sourced. So sort of if you wanted to host it yourself, that's that's something that's absolutely possible. Just head over to the GitHub clone the uh, the latest version and you can follow that documentation through uh, alternatively we do offer a, a hosted service as well um, but but from there we're, there's there's documentation online um, for configuring sort of setting up adding your data site credentials and setting the necessary options within the system uh, to allow you to start registering DOIs um, almost, almost instantly really um, yeah I'd be happy to sort of follow that up with links after the session if anyone would be interested with those um, but yeah, once the system's configured and ready to register the DOIs, it's simply a case of sort of heading to the output that needs a DOI, clicking a button. Um, if there are any mandatory data is missing, then you sort of alert it to that and fill that in. And then, yeah, the registration sort of happens in the background. Um, kind of, yeah, easy, straightforward, sort of small workflow. Awesome. Great. Thank you. Um, over to you, Ian. Yeah, so um, so so Rediv is is a it's a hosted service. Um, it's actually kind of a it's a multi tenant environment. So different universities can have their own data portals on the platform. Um, and the goal there is that if I'm a researcher and I have, I have access to different data sets across different institutions, or say one institution uh, hosts a public data set, I can kind of easily combine those all together on the platform. Um, so, so yeah, it's it's pretty straightforward to um, integrate with uh, data site. Uh, just uh, first, you would start by reaching out to us to spin up a new data portal. Um, we we have a system where you can either be um, a single research organization, or you can also deploy um, institution wide to support the use case where you have multiple organizations, you know, different centers, labs, libraries, um, or hosting data at your institution, and then provide global discovery um, across the institution. Um, configuring data site itself is is very straightforward. I think you just uh, Type in a, your repository ID, prefix and password. We validate those credentials, um, and afterwards we start issuing DOIs for every version of every data set um, that you upload. And we can also automatically back issue DOIs for historic data sets. So if a group has started using Redivis, has uploaded a bunch of data, data sets, um, they can kind of post hoc um, bring in the, their data set credentials. Awesome, great, thank you. I'm over to you, Will. Yes, so uh, so uh, with as mentioned before, um, much like Kai's ePrints is open source uh, repository, and and there are sort of a couple of major sort of service providers, but obviously people can self-host as well. Um, uh, but also, so ePrints has a sort of like plugin-based architecture. So essentially, there is a data sites uh, plugin, and that's available on GitHub and also on what we have a sort of like a shop front for our plugins, which is called the Bazaar. Um, and so users, uh, uh, repository users can either sort of, if they're hosting their own repository, can install it from there, or if they've got a, a sort of friendly service provider uh, like ourselves, that can say so then um, they can uh, ask us to install it for them. And so when we're going through, like when we're going through the process of uh, setting someone up with data site, we, we, we sort of we have staging repositories alongside their sort of live repositories. And so it's because we would encourage um, the, uh, the institution to get in touch with data site and and you know register for for like the sandbox um fabrica environment and all that sort of stuff get some credentials from there and then once the plugins installed we can configure that plugin uh with the prefix and all, all the details and um to you know connect to the api and then some sort of then um they can do some sort of testing with it and check that everything is working as expected and when that's all good then we would make those changes onto the live repository with, with the account credentials for for the the main fabrica environment um so yeah really it's that sort of whole uh, like once once you've got the plugin installed and there's a bit of configuration it all just hopefully uh, it was a nice smooth workflow um so yeah, yeah. excellent thank you um and over to you sonia and then we'll move to you for the next question as well 
I'll stop sharing my screen. Oh, Sonia, you're muted, sorry. Thank you. I said it's easier to share when I have my slides up. It's easier for me to remember what I'm talking about. So um, for Dataverse installations, by default, um, the installation attempts to register DOIs um, once a installation is set up. Um, it's under a test authority. So then the installation owners have to actually apply for DOI credentials. Um, so the installer is going to configure a default DOI namespace with, da with the um, data site. And there are separate instructions because the software supports DOIs and handles. Um, and then there are configuration options for the DOIs. So um, nothing is going to be actually registered until the person um, or the entity um, gets their own credentials from data site. Um, and then they would get DOIs for data sets and file level DOIs are also available um, and they can configure their repository to support file level DOIs. That's an option. Uh, whereas all the data sets are required to have a DOI, file level DOIs um, can be configured as an option. So for the Harvard Dataverse, for example, we've decided that um, because it's a generalist repository and we have so many files and so many data sets that we are going to um, have um, groups, organizations, um, journals, et cetera, ask us if they want file level DOIs um, before we provide that as a general um, option. Excellent, thank you. Yeah, great to hear from everyone on how um, to get started with registering DOIs. And so our next question, um, and Sonia, if you can then share your screen right away here. Um, okay. So I want to talk about um, metadata completeness and metadata mapping. And so whenever a repository is sending metadata to data sites, there typically has to be some sort of mapping or crosswalk between metadata stored in that repository and then the, metadata, the data site metadata schema. And so question for our panelists here is, does your platform's metadata mapping crosswalks make use of the data site recommended and optional properties? So for example, things like subject, description, and funding reference and any specific properties you want to highlight in that. Okay. All righty. So um, here's this, these are the um, metadata references and we do use, make use of data sites recommended and optional properties. Um, so we use obviously standard compliant metadata that can be easily mapped to the schemas exported into JSON um, in particular. And we uh, are compliant with DDA, DDI Lite, DDI 2.5, Data Site 3.1, and Dublin Core. Um, and this is just a list of the metadata that we support. And we have links to all of our um, metadata crosswalk available here. Um, in terms of what we actually make required, um, it's title, author, contact, description, and subject. We don't yet require affiliation, um, but we always um, update our required metadata fields every couple of years, depending on you know, the metrics we run and where we see where people are leaving off information that could be helpful. So, um, that's the supported metadata and the supported metadata export formats. And let me see. Yeah, I think I'm going to leave it there because the next question is something different. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. Um, and we'll go to Will then. I'll put the question back up for everyone. Uh, yes. So, yeah, we do make use of some of the uh, sort of recommended optional properties. So, I mean, um, yeah, ePrint uh, tends to be quite flexible in how it can be configured. And that means that, in a sense, not only can we, it can be, it can be very configurable as to what fields are even present in the repository to begin with. And then, of course, that the, the sort of the mapping uh, of how they, how the, the fields that are stored in the repository map over to sort of data site XML, which ultimately gets Sort of shipped off to the data site API. That all can be, uh, yeah, quite um, sort of customizable or configurable. Um, and so often it also depends on what kind of uh, research output 
we are creating a DOI for. So for example, yeah, we make use of the um, descriptions, um, uh, uh, met, uh, prop, uh, property field. Um, and like, for example, if we, if that was, if we're making a DOI for a journal article, uh, we would use the abstract. Whereas if we're doing it for a, um, a data set, then we might use um, something like the collection method or something about like a provenance field or something like that. Um, similarly for things like the subjects field, um we would map our keywords field uh, because whilst there is like uh, uh, there is often like a, a hierarchy of subjects that can be that's a that can also be like a really configurable thing depending on the institution um and and can be very well sort of defined so often like for example use the keywords field by default as a way of just getting some subject information across um and when it comes to things like like funding references um, once again, this sort of depends on, on how the repository is configured. So sort of by default, ePrints will come with quite a basic funders field where you can just type in some text about funders. But if you've got, if you've got like the Reox uh, plugin installed, for, which sort of supports the whole Reox framework of metadata, um, which a lot of our sort of UK repositories have installed, then it will grab a bit more structured data about funders and grant numbers and projects from there. Similarly, some repositories will have like a crossref lookup, a crossref DOI lookup of funders. Um, and so if that's available, when we know that well, the DOIs that we've got representing those funders are, are sort of valid ones from crossref. So we'll sort of, along with the funder information, we'll add the a sort of a, a, a sort of um, attribute along with that to say this is a cross, this is crossref funder ID. Um, and so, yeah, we'll make sort of use of um, yeah, there's various sort of optional attributes and, and fields and things um, as much as we can, really. Um, so, yeah, it, by default, the plugin comes with a whole sort of bunch of mappings, but often they are configured to sort of be optimal for the repository in question. Um, so, yeah. Awesome. Thank you. It's great to hear. Um, so we'll move now to Ian from Red. Can you mute it, Ian? Sorry. If I, if I could share my, I'll share my screen here um, just to walk through. I won't claim to be nearly as well prepared as Sonia here, but maybe it's, it's just helpful to, to see a, a data set on Reddit is and, and kind of so it's like walk through some of the fields that we map to. Um, so this is just a, a public data set that this group at Stanford hosts. Um, and and so to answer the question, yeah, we we I think we map to pretty much every field that is, is at least kind of relevant for the sorts of data that we host. Um, and it's really just a mapping between um, the metadata on Reddit is um, and how you know we have it in our schema to to data site. Um, so I can go in here and you know if I'm editing this data set. Um, so some of this information is auto generated and then some of it would be provided by a data curator or administrator. Um, so tags, for example, um, would be subject um, in the, the data site schema. Um, there's you know an abstract and methodological information and, and whatnot. Um, so we convert this all to Markdown and, and send that to data site as well. Um, the I guess a, a big thing um, to uh, call out is is this provenance section here, um, which really is where uh, somebody can go in and kind of customize a lot of the information that ultimately gets sent to data site. Um, and so you can specify um, you know different uh, contributors and their contribution type. Um, as well as the individual who did the contribution, um, and these can either be individuals or actually just just organizations. Um, and then when we have it for the individual, we have uh, the orchid attached. Or I guess that's the next question. Uh, but so yeah, we have the orchids and RORs attached, um, as well as any other uh, related identifiers. Um, so this this data set is derived from a NOAA data set, so we can kind of reference the original source material. Um, I mentioned that some um, some content's auto generated, so um, to, to start. Um, the contributors actually get auto populated as um, somebody curates the data set. So if I go in here and start editing this, I'll be added to that contributor list by default. Um, and something that I'm I'm really passionate about is trying to better tie the people who do the 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 messy work of curating data sets to the final research output. Um, I think that often they maybe don't get enough credit, um, and that ultimately. Um, ends in, in data curation being kind of uh, under-resourced, um, but that's kind of the, the foundation upon which all of this data-driven research is based, right? Um, so really, really thinking about how we can tie, you know, when a paper gets published, we can properly accredit those individuals who spent a ton of time in actually creating and curating that data set that allowed for that research to happen in the first place. Um, so, so anyway, so uh, that's the kind of contributor section. 
Um, and then finally, um, as data is uploaded to the data set, we can potentially pull out certain metadata um, just based on the data that's been provided. Um, so if you see it right here, uh, we have the temporal range of these, these data. So it goes back to the 1760s. Um, so um, that's just based off of uh, summary statistics on a particular date that we have in this in this table. Um, so we're able to pull that information out um, and then uh, send that to data site. Um, and similarly, we have geospatial information here. Um, this is actually a global data set, so the bounding box isn't particularly interesting, but um, we send um, we send the bounding box of the data um, whenever we have it. And then the admin can also go in here and um, customize this information as well. Awesome, great. Yeah, thank you. And yeah, I think I just saw someone in the chat. I echo that love the credit for data curators. That's awesome. And what's it, Taylor? Yeah, sure. So the uh, the repository that we have is, is built on a sort of generic information management platform, uh, which sets it up for really extreme sort of flexibility, uh, both in the output types that can be stored, as well as the fields for each of those outputs. Um, so our solution comes with a, so it's a rich schema pretty much out of the box, uh, covers a really wide range of needs for basically all types of research outputs. Uh, this is standards led and it does map really well to various metadata formats, including data site, of course. Um, yeah, so I mean, like we're, we're proud to be supporting the schema up to version 4.3 um, with development of 4.4 kind of closing out final final QA now. Um, but in terms of the, the fields we cover, um, I think it's virtually all of them. Um, I think there's a few that we don't. So it is all of the required, of course. The majority of the recommended and some of the optional are missing, I think. There's only there's three or four that are missing. Um, I think those are things like language, size, and format. And I don't think we quite have the polygon for geolocation just yet. Um, but all of the others, um, I'm pretty sure, are there. Awesome. Thank you. And that's a really good point that when we talk about metadata completeness of data say, we're not saying include every field if it doesn't make sense. Like it's what's relevant to your specific repository and community. And that's what we would say is, is complete, right? Um, and so I guess for the last question here, I know some of you've already touched on this. Um, so in addition to the, you know, the overall 20 data site properties, there are also these sub properties and attributes. Um, and if you read the last session, we talked about different PID connections um, and these, for some of them, they support interoperability between PID systems. So for example, you can have ORCID for a creator or um, a variety for an organization. I'm sorry, I forgot to actually move the question here. Um, and so the question here is, does your platform support these identifier fields? Um, that create these linkages between DOIs and other persistent identifiers? And if not, is it on your roadmap for the future? Um, we'll start with you again, Taylor. Yeah, sure. I mean, the answer to this is, is pretty short. It's yes. Um, so yeah, we support a, a quite a range of, of PIDs in the system. Um, and yeah, where this is possible, they're submitted to data site. Um, so the creators and contributors, where we have them, they're usually submitted with their, their ORCID IDs. Um, and also the affiliations, for those those people as well, I think our default uses grids rather than raw IDs, but I think we're going to look at sort of making that that leap across at some point soon. But yeah, I mean, short answer is is yes. Awesome, great, and good to hear. And thinking about the transition from grid to raw as well. Um, and Ian, I know you touched on this a bit, but if there's anything more you want to add on the identifier piece. Um. Yeah. So. Uh, so yeah, we collect. Um, or you, researchers are encouraged to link their ORCID account when they sign up for Redibiz, um, and then um, and institutions and organizations can provide an ROR. Um, so yeah, that that's all linked. I, I guess the one thing that I, I can add, and I, I think I mentioned this in one of our smaller meetings before, uh, but just since there are more people in the room, um, I would love a world where there was some sort of um, uh, unique identifier for sub organizations. Um, so something that we're just struggling with right now is not really struggling, but you know there are ultimately research centers, groups, labs that are hosting data sets on Reddit is. Um, so you know if if to, to say that you know oh this data set's hosted by Harvard, that doesn't give me uh, you know you know who do I email at Harvard to find uh, this data set five years from now, right? Um, and so you know the, the academic institutions are these various nebulous entities, and there's not really like a, a, a central. Um, or there's not much of a central entity, if you will. So um, it would be really nice to have a, a persistent identifier uh, that would kind of attach to these um, sub organizations within an institution that we could use as kind of a canonical um, entity because also names change um, frequently. And there's a lot of different ways you can you know, spell or write the name of a particular center. Um, so that doesn't always uh, work for uh, disambiguation purposes. 
definitely a, a tricky problem. Um, we'll go to Will next to this question. Um, uh, yes. So yeah, I mean, yeah, we do support uh, orchids um, certainly, and adding so, so adding that to like uh, creators and contributors' uh, information um, when generating the data to XML. Um, raw IDs, and I mean, not so much sort of sort of straight out of the uh, out of the box, as it were. Um, but like I was saying earlier, I mean, it, it is. Or I mean, if if there's when there are repositories that are making use of these, then sort of getting that added in is not really a problem. Um, and I know that there is uh, some sort of like more of a community effort in the Ubers community to really sort of uh, nail down the problem of how do you store sort of multiple different IDs that represent all the different, you know, different IDs you can have to represent um, uh, an output, let alone all, all the other sort of different entities. Um, um, and we certainly do include other DOIs uh, essentially where possible, either to represent, as I was saying earlier, like funders or if there are related uh, works um and that sort of thing so yeah yeah so yeah plans to introduce more ids um and any ids at the repository or sort of pids that the repository has already tend to get included in the data site where possible awesome thank you and sonia hey. oh, sorry again yeah <laughs> sorry oh you're all good yeah okay so um Yes, we support multiple IDs, but uh, to the ones that you mentioned in terms of ORCID and more IDs, so ORCID is absolutely supported. Um, and one of the things that we do with the Harvard repository and all Dataverse installations is they have a contact not just for the um, hosting repository, but each data set, the contact goes directly to the author. And what authors tend to do when they come to us, if they're not just depositing, depositing a single data set, um, the best practice that we encourage is creating a collection space because they keep coming back and updating their affiliation. I know that was a question someone asked. They keep coming back and contacting us to update their account and their affiliation, um, especially if they used um, an affiliated um, sign-in, um, shiblet sign-in that's you know tied to a university and they move. So they can continue using their space for all of their research um, way beyond their, their affiliation. They contact us to update that information, but um, we do um, encourage that they tie their data, um, their deposits to ORCID. And for the ROAR, so we recently did um, um, some testing. Um, I think it was earlier this year. Um, this uh, code was contributed by um, community members um, who contribute to the software code. And so there is um, support for um, the registry organization. Um, research organization registry. We haven't put it yet into the Harvard Dataverse because I think we were still working around some questions and you know just where and how we wanted to, to use it, um, especially when affiliation is not required um, by the Harvard repository yet, but this is the workflow of what that would look like. So it already is part of and available um, in the software and I know some installations are already using, using it. Awesome, great. Thank you. And thank you for, uh, to everyone for all your answers to starting off questions. Um, so we've got a few coming in from the audience here as well. And so the first question, um, interesting one to, to all panelists, um, are you checking who or what institutions use your software that does not get used for predatory purposes? And anyone who wants to take that. Yeah, we, we I mean, I'll start. We, we do um, have a, um, kind of a query information um, thing on Twitter, uh, for example, so that anytime the word Dataverse pops up, we can check and see what's going on. Of course, we found a lot that we're using Dataverse uh, for their uh, software that they shouldn't have been using. Um, and it's, it is, uh, there is a trademark um, to the Dataverse name, so um, we do check, and then obviously anyone who's on the map, on the map that I showed earlier, who gets on our map, we validate that they're actually sharing data um, and using the installation for, uh, or the software for the original purpose. Like I said, it is open source, so they don't, they don't get to be on the map if they're using it internally and not sharing their data to others, but we do have um, research groups that, again, they just need a data sharing platform for their in-house researchers. Um, and they're allowed to use that, but they're not on the map and they're not violating anything, so. 
definitely it makes sense it's a tricky problem with open source software i'm like wondering will if you have any thoughts on that as well for ePrint. Um, yes, yeah, I mean, yeah, ePrint, I mean, I, I'm, yeah, I'm not 100% sure who is using this software around the world. I mean, it's, it's something that is tracked to a certain extent with things like the um, the uh, the uh, raw map, I want to say, is that the what I think, the, thing? the, the registry of repositories. Um, and, and I mean, certainly, I think anyone, like for all of the ones that are, all the repositories that we support, uh, obviously, they they are all um, you know log into those repositories or all tends to be managed very much via institutional login, so via um, Shibboleth or your um, your Active Directory sort of things, um, and so in a sense that is controlled by the institutions themselves um, as to who can actually log into the repository and sort of start uh, generating uh, DOIs and things. Um, but it is to a certain extent, yes, I mean, it is open source uh, software, so anyone can download it and anyone could install the plugin. Um, but then obviously they also need to get hold of data site credentials. Um, so, I mean, yes, yeah, I don't know. I hope that answers the question a bit, um, but it's, uh, yeah, it is a tricky one, yeah. Yeah, definitely, I think that does help. And yeah, of course for data site, um, only members can register DOI, so that is the check on the registration, but also the platform in general can be used that DOI. Um, Ian or Taylor, do you have anything to add to this one? I, I think my answer is, is similar similar to Will. I, I guess um I mean we we have, do have a contractual relationship with any an institution or organization that's hosting data on Rediviz. Um, but there's anybody currently can can log into Rediviz uh, with an institutional account, so through, through Shibboleth. Um, but we are we are actually opening this up to people who maybe don't have academic credentials because we're starting to work with you know people in the nonprofit sector and people in um, and just like in government um so we want we want to think about how we can also support those users um so so yeah i think this is um you know a, a, something that we'll have to continue to keep a pulse on and, and a bridge we'll have to cross as, as we grow yeah Definitely. yeah it's pretty much the same for us keeping uh the authentication restricted to people with single sign-on um but uh, yeah is the tricky problem with open source is <laughs> anyone can sort of get hold of it and get going um but yeah, there's hopefully enough um, sort of barriers to doing that sort of maliciously um, in needing to get all the credentials, so. Right, definitely, makes sense. Thank you all. Um, so our next question, um, so I actually might make this a bit broader. So the question is, funding is a critical piece of metadata that captures, and is there any way to make both the funder name and ID required? So definitely interested in that for funders, but also curious about for some of the other identifiers as well, if there's any plans to make things like ORCID or ROAR IDs required in the metadata, even though they're not in the data site schema. Um, I guess I can start again. For So for the Dataverse platform, in particular, I'm gonna talk about the Harvard Dataverse because every installation runs their own rules. Um, for the Harvard Dataverse, um, we allow people to create their collections and within their collections, they can set their workflows. So they can, for their group, their organization, their journal, make whatever they need to make required. So we leave that to them as a choice. Uh, when they create their space with us though, their Dataverse collection space, um, we do require, um, I believe affiliation started being required maybe a year ago in the collection space. So we know what organization institution is creating the space, but then they decide what they make required within that space for their depositors. Um, so they control their workflow. Now we have, uh, for example, a big um, NIH project mm -hmm. for generalist repository infrastructures with six other repositories. And for the NIH supported data, we are working um, in a co-op petition to make certain metadata, um, we want, I'll say required for now, uh, we're gonna urge folks to complete those fields, um, including the funding field, since it is NIH specific data that we're supporting. So uh, we do allow flexibility in the workflows in the Dataverse installation. And that's so that some, you know, people who don't need it don't, are not forced to use it, um, and then those who really need it can use it, and it's available. I really like that idea of um, within a certain context in enforcing metadata as required. Um, we, we we don't do that right now, but I think that that makes a lot of sense because for for us, some of our users, organizations, um, 
these, some of these fields don't make sense in, in the nonprofit sector. A lot of people don't have orchids. Maybe they should, but we're not there yet. Um, but for the for the cases when you know the people should be um, including these metadata, then it would be really nice if yeah they could they could specify that. Um, yeah, I think it's certainly sort of a similar uh, situation in uh, ePrints as well. I mean, it, it sort of where that, that whole sort of deposit workflow, when someone is actually adding a record, then yes, we, you, uh, we can add in sort of all manner of sort of checks um, as required. And yeah, making sure that both fields are required. Um, but also, you know, there's, I guess, a check can be carried out at both when you're making your deposit but also when you're making your sort of um request data site the check i mean out there it, you know you it obviously prevents you from making a request if the the um required uh the minimum required fields on the data site schema aren't present then you can't make a request there's no reason why that can't just be expanded to include sort of funder name and id um but i guess sort of the other approach that we sort of take with this uh, to a certain extent is is now we, we have we have a cross ref doi look up for funders and it's that case well actually if, he, if people are only adding named we can and to a certain extent automatically backfill funder ids if if cross if we can if we can sort of automate requests to the crossref funder registry and we get sort of unambiguous responses back as to what the id might be then um then by all means we can sort of start adding those in automatically to sort of get more ids in the system without having to sort of get people to really make sure they're typing uh, or, or clicking all the right buttons. Sure, yeah, we, we take a bit of a different approach. Um, so a lot of the the, the point with the, the repository is to minimize sort of data re-entry. So a lot of our fields are links to other sort of objects or records. And various of like types of these might be funders or different types of organization. Typically we don't allow researchers to create uh, these organizations, because then you end up with a big long list of some that probably aren't really needed or a lot of typos and things like that. So typically they get entered as sort of free text, free text values. And then during the mediation process, some library staff will take that sort of make sure the name's correct, create a real record for it. So as part of that, that's sort of empowering the institution to make that decision for themselves, the IDs uh, and the names. So they can pop in the the raw when we get there uh, for now the grids um, or the the funder references as well um, and then that's sort of there in in perpetuity for anyone to then say this was done by this funder we have that fund ref stored against the record and that kind of just uh, flows through uh, as a permanent data. Awesome, thanks. All really interesting um, answers all of these questions. Um, I think just looking at the time and we don't have any more coming in the Q and A. We did want to leave a break between all the sessions today because we have a long day for folks. So I think we'll wrap this one up. But first, thank you so much for all of your um, answers today and for sharing all this information. I'm just going to pop a couple links in the chat for folks um, from, my, from the presentation about search providers listing, further information if you're interested. And you can always get in touch with us at um, support at if you've got any questions about repository integrations, and we can point you to the various options that are registered service providers. So thanks so much, everyone. and. Hope to see you all in the next session. Take care. Thanks all. Thanks. Thanks very much. Thank you. Everyone. Thank you. Nice to meet you all. Likewise. Thanks, Kelly. Thank you. Thanks. See you.